Good afternoon. I am Andrea Chisholm with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. With about two hours to go before the highly anticipated crime summit, the parliamentary opposition says it's not expecting a definitive position on the issue. The meeting will involve several stakeholders, including the private sector, government officials, and members of the public sector. Opposition spokesman on national security, Fitz Jackson, says today's meeting is an important first step in the fight against crime. The meeting gets underway at 2 o'clock at the Jamaica Conference Center and will be closed to the public. Mr. Jackson says a joint statement will be issued following the meeting. And we will decide, seek to decide on a, a way forward after this first, this, this consultation exercise. We, the People's National Party, had a similar consultation. It led, because of the intransigence of the government, um, to make an effort. The private sector grouping um, recognized the importance of having the government being integrally involved, because at the end of the day, it is the government that has to be has to implement whatever is agreed to. We have proposals coming out of the consultation, but that serves to indicate a collective position, but it must be led by the government uh, because it has to be implemented. And with the government participation now, we expect to be able to move forward with those collective thinking. Opposition Senator Lambert Brown is taking the Justice Minister to task for failing to publicly speak out against the arrest of innocent persons. For Minister Chuck not, not to come out and speak about those people tells me that his position smells of hypocrisy. The same goes for Al Miller, who said the Commissioner of Police must apologize for pre dawn raid, for people who are charged, but people who are not charged in pre dawn raid. There's no apology for them, no respect for them. This society has too many double standards. Senator Brown was contributing to the debate to extend states of a public emergency in the Senate. He said that 85% of the 4,111 persons detained since January last year have been released without charge. Meanwhile, another opposition senator, Katie Knight, warned against mass detentions, pointing to the 1992 deaths of Agana Barrett, Ian Forbes, and Vassa Brown at the Constant Spring Police lockup. The men died after suffocating in a crammed and poorly ventilated jail we cell. We don't begin to understand the ramifications of just scraping up. Then we're going to be in further trouble because people get aggressive. They start to resent the police. And if you resent the police, you cannot work with the police. The St. Catherine South Police have listed seven men wanted for murders and shootings within the division. Among those listed as wanted for murder is 21-year-old Damian Henry, otherwise called Devil of Burke Road, Old Harbor, St. Catherine. Ground Commander for the State of Emergency in St. Catherine South, Superintendent Winfred Campbell, wants the men to turn themselves in. He was speaking at a stakeholders' meeting last night. Martin Brown, he frequents Linstead and he's wanted for murder. He's from Watson Grove in Portmore, St. Catherine. Damian Henry, OC Devil, he's 21 years old. He's from Burke Road or Old Harbor, St. Catherine. He's wanted also for murder. Dane Ellis, O.C. Bud, Sukaba Gardens, Old Harbor, wanted for murder. Marlon Bennett, Shortman, O.C. Shortman, or O.C. Jamo. He's from Gulf in Gregory Park. He's wanted for murder, properly wanted. Stokely Collins, O.C. Pepper, from Windsor Heights, Central Village. 
is wanted for the murder of Alvin Brown. All right. Dane Brooks, OC Kid of Boston Road, Waterford, St. Catherine, is wanted for shooting. And Jason Duncan, OC Teflon, OC Big Eye, wanted for shooting with intent of five persons. A 10-year-old boy is dead after sustaining injuries from a motor vehicle crash on Monday. Colin Lloyd Jr. was a student of the Lime Hall Primary School in St. Anne. TVJ's Prince Moore reports. What was a routine for 10-year-old Colin Lloyd Jr., also called CJ on a daily basis, became tragedy in a split second on Monday afternoon. It's understood that CJ was on his way from school when he attempted to cross the road near his school in Lime Hall when he was hit by a bus. He suffered serious injuries and was rushed to the St. Anne's Bay Regional Hospital where his condition worsened. He was then transferred to the Bustamante Hospital for Children on Tuesday. He died a day later on Wednesday evening. His mother, Deandra Ridley, told TVJ News that on her last visit with her son, he asked to use the bathroom, but she told him he could not move, so he should use the pampas which he was wearing. He responded no. The mother says shortly after, his breathing worsened. So they're going to put him in the ICU. Now getting him ready to go to the ICU, he started fighting them because they said that he's getting confused because there's no ox oxygen going to the brain. So he, got, uh, he started getting angry, he started fighting them, like literally fighting them, and then he started bleeding through his nose. His father, Colin Lloyd Sr., is still trying to cope with the loss. CJ was very strong. All he wanted was just, just to see me, all in the state of pain. All he wanted was to see me and just hold me. Still so unbelievable. What's it? No. Nothing can comfort me right now. Just was about the sun. Principal of the Lime Hall Primary School, Janet Hay, described Colin as a good student. A very promising young man, very manly, very friendly, you know, and we really hoped that we, he would have survived. Now at his desk, these notes with the all too familiar RIPs and gone too soon. The police have since confirmed that the vehicle involved in the crash was taken to the motor vehicle examination depot in St. Anne's Bay for testing. The driver has been interviewed and has been warned for prosecution. Prince Moore, TVJ News. The Jamaica Labour Party and the People's National Party have agreed in principle to participate in up to three political debates ahead of the next general election. They will be organized by the Jamaica Debates Commission. Jamaica's next general election is due between February 25, 2021 and June 10 of the same year. However, Prime Minister Andrew Holness may call the election early. In a release today, the Jamaica Debates Commission said a memorandum of understanding was signed yesterday by the general secretaries of both major political parties. The proposal is as follows. The first debate would focus on social issues, the second on the economy, and the third debate between the contenders for the office of the Prime Minister. The debates will be broadcast live via television, radio and the Internet. And it's time for a break here on the Midday News, but stay with us. More stories right after these messages. Welcome back and we're continuing the news. A government senator has again defended the government's push for the implementation of a national identification system, saying it's an important tool in helping to quickly identify and catch criminals. Senator Charles Sinclair was responding to opposition Senator Lambert Brown, who questioned the crime-fighting strategy. TVJ's Krista Campbell reports. At Wednesday's sitting of the Senate, Lambert Brown pointed to a spiraling crime situation plaguing the island and a government, he said, is losing the fight to bring crime figures down. 
He noted that robberies remain a challenge, making special note of a recent incident at a Western Union in St. Elizabeth. Unknown brothers got cornered within 24 hours. Three weeks now, and we can't corner some brazen criminal robbing a Santa Cruz business in the bright of day. Tells me something about our crime fighting, and it tells me why I have to doubt and have some lack of confidence in the leadership that failed to capture those people. He insisted tools are available for the government to use to help solve certain crimes, especially when they're caught on camera. I know, Mr. President, that when Senator Kady Knight was Minister of National Security, facial recognition, the technology of facial recognition was introduced to PICA. That technology exists in the world. It exists in Jamaica. Has it been used? And it has, that has been doing a very good job in identifying persons who may have applied for passports using other names and then come back since the implementation of that system and have applied for passports. It picks them up quite quickly. Government Senator Charles Sinclair stressed it's why his government had been advocating for the introduction of a central identification system which would, among other things, help to make it easier to catch criminals. You took the, the, the video footage from the robbery the other day in St. Elizabeth. What would it be matching against? Because a person may have existed, those persons may have no identification at all. They may not be the whole of a passport. They may not be who will offer an electoral identification. So what would it match up against? Krista Campbell, TVJ News. There's a call this afternoon for Jamaicans to do more to protect the environment by restricting developments which destroy forestry and mangroves. There's also a view that local hoteliers should contribute towards conservation efforts. More in this report. The second Tourism Resilience Summit of the Americas was staged at the regional headquarters of the University of the West Indies over two days last week. And the stakeholders who attended warned local authorities about paying lip service to environmental protection. For them, promises and plans won't save residents, the infrastructure and the environment when disaster strikes. A call was therefore made for local leaders to prove they are serious, by stopping the destruction of critical areas such as forests and mangroves. In Montego Bay, there is a marine park which protects all the coral reefs that the hotels in Montego Bay use for visitors. But they do not pay the operational cost of that marine park. So there's a spillover. I'm not an economist, but I know spillovers are bad and I know externalizing costs are bad. It causes all kinds of distortions. So you, one of the things you'll have to figure out is how do you stop the distortions? How do you create a fair and just economy as far as tourism is concerned? And in your own self-interests, how do you make sure that the natural basis for your business continues to survive? In addition to saving livelihoods, conservation efforts can also save lives. One of the speakers at the summit recalled his trip to Abaco in the Bahamas just months before Hurricane Dorian struck. He fears the region, including Jamaica, should learn lessons from what that hurricane did in Abaco. Out of all the destinations we chose to reach out to conduct two of our annual crisis readiness and response workshops, which we rotate every year, ironically, we did them in, in Abaco and Grand Bahama in April. Our challenge with how to better prepare and respond to these unfortunate and increasingly frequent occurrences and pay the incredible cost of restoration. Regional leaders were also encouraged to use their collective voice at global summits to get action on climate change. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. And that's the Midday News. I'm Andrea Chisholm. Join us at 7 for the Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.